Tonight I want to bring another study in prayer because a Christian, especially a charismatic Christian, spends most of his or her time, or a lot of it, in prayer. Even while you're doing other things, you're praying in the Spirit, you're meditating, you're communing with God. And it bears repetition that prayer is no more effective than your ability to pray in faith and get answers. Certainly there are conditions that we must meet, and tonight we want to deal with some of those from a fresh or new standpoint. And like so many messages, I guess about all of them, if not all of them, all I get is the title, and then the Lord, if I will obey him, and not try to reason out and say, well, that doesn't make any sense, or doesn't sound like what he's speaking about, then he gives me the rest of it. And so tonight it was the same way, the message tonight. All I got was from here to there through prayer. <laughs> but it does make sense once you see what the Lord wants us to know about that. From here to there through prayer. Well, you can figure that out if we gave you five minutes. Some of you get it quicker maybe. Here is where we are on earth. There's where he is in heaven. And it's a prayer of faith that brings the here and the there together. You see, when you pray in faith, you're right in the presence of God and he's in your presence in a very unique way. From here to there through prayer. Now, Jesus taught us that the Father is in heaven because he taught us to pray in Matthew 6. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and so forth. You know that one by heart. Now, he could have taught us to say, Our Father, hallowed be thy name, and leave out which art in heaven. I mean, we know he's there. Why did he add that? It's because he wants us to recognize where we are in relationship to where he is, and that it's faith that brings us together. Now, that's quite significant that in just a few words of teaching us how to pray, the model prayer, he inserted our Father which art in heaven. Well, he didn't have to tell us that. We know that. But really, we don't know it in the sense that he wants us to know it until tonight. We'll see how that it's through believing prayer we bring the here and the there together. Now, he also taught that God is present. Not only is he there, but God is present in believing prayer. For example, in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, I'll quote it. I know you can too. Where he, first of all, contrasts where we are and where God is and then shows how that we come together assuming you make the prayer of faith, of course, because he doesn't listen to any prayer that isn't believing prayer. First John 5 says that he only hears prayers made according to his will, and faith is one of the conditions for him hearing prayer, isn't it? But he said there in Matthew 18, 19, where two are agreed on earth. That's where we are. That's touching anything they ask. It'll be done for them by my Father, which is in heaven. See, again, He's telling us things we don't need to know. We already know them, but the reason he's saying them is why, well, we preach a faith message at least once a week around here. It's because we need to be reminded, and then there are a lot of facets and aspects to the Word of God, especially the faith message. There are many aspects that you don't get by one hearing. Even if you heard the same message over and over, it would be good because some people get healed that way, wear tapes out on faith, a tape, to get healed. It's happened. But he said, where two are agreed on earth, that's where we are, then God in heaven will give us our petition. Now that is how we're separated. The next verse, we're brought together. For where two or three are gathered in my name, not just praying, but in my name, which implies that you're meeting the conditions, there am I in the midst of them. So praise the Lord. We bring the here and there together through believing prayer. Now, certainly Christ is present in our hearts, John 14. He says he'll abide in our hearts if we obey him. And he promised in Matthew 28 to be with us always. But what I want to address myself to in this study on prayer tonight is that God has ordained prayer as a means by which we can personally commune with him in a way that you can't while you're keeping books or ironing a shirt or something. Now, I don't mean you can't pray at those times, but it's pretty hard 2.9786 times whatever and be praying. But there are times when you can pray, you know, while the adding machine is giving you the total. 
But anyway, while we know he's present in our hearts, yet it is through believing prayer that his personal presence is manifested in the answer. What I'm saying is he's present in our hearts, but when you have a need like healing, now healing isn't just a word or something that if you believe it, you get healed, but God personally comes down and he's present in the person of the Holy Spirit. You can't divide God up and does the healing. Or if you need spiritual wisdom, a financial need met, protection, deliverance, then the way that God's personal presence is manifested is by you offering believing prayer. That is the prayer of faith. And the answer is the manifestation of his presence. You see, in a healing, or protection or deliverance, or as I say, if you need wisdom to make a decision, it's the wisdom of the Spirit. He's there speaking to you, giving you that. And so it's through making believing prayer that the personal presence of God is manifested or demonstrated. You know, if he's going to anoint a minister for the operation of the gifts after a message, you see, and he prays for the anointing. Well, that anointing isn't a word. It isn't something that, you know, you clothe yourself with. That's the Holy Spirit, God personally present, Working through the hands are the word of knowledge, are the spoken word and faith. It's like the power supply in a radio. The battery in a radio is power there to produce an answer to something you want. Let's say you want a weather report, and we won't digress again into the fact that, well, if you want to go somewhere, you'll believe for good weather. But the point is, God gives you a mind you use a little common sense. If you turn the radio on, you're going south and you hear a foot of snow in Louisville, you may take your four-wheel vehicle instead of your little Datsun roller skate. <laughs> common sense. So you want the weather report. Not that you're going to worry about it, but I'm trying to make a point. I'll get to it in a minute. You turn the radio on to get the information you need, like the promise in James 1, if you need wisdom, ask for it and you'll get it. But you've got to ask in faith, he says, nothing doubting or you'll not get it. And so that power in the radio, the battery, is only there as a potential. You, by faith, have to believe that when you throw the switch, it comes on and you'll get the information you need. And so it is with prayer. You see, when you turn the radio on, then all of that potential power begins to surge and flow through the wires and the transistors and the resistors and the capacitors and all of that, and out comes the information you want. It's just like praying, but you've got to throw the switch, and you've got to believe it. I mean, if you didn't believe you'd get some information or didn't believe the radio would work, no faith, you see, then you wouldn't get anything. And so tonight I want to give some of the scriptural requirements for bringing here and there together through believing prayer. We know we have to believe. That's basic or essential. But to have God's presence personally manifested or demonstrated, which is what the answer to prayer is, or the healing is, or the anointing is, or the deliverance is. You see, that's God's personal presence by the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to deal with several things tonight that will enable us to bring heaven and earth together. You've got the problem, you've got the need, he's got the answer. You've got to get them together. Now, how do you do that? How do you bring here and there together through prayer? First of all, when you pray, focus all of your attention, not some of it, all of it, on the there, not here. Now you see, that's just another approach to Matthew chapter 6 that we taught again and again and again in various ways. Matthew 6.33. He says, Take no thought for the here, your material needs, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the there, where he is. God, his promises, his word, his faithfulness. Focus all of your attention on there, not here. Oh, you can articulate your need, but you're not informing God, remember. You're not giving him information. Jesus said in the same chapter here in Matthew 6 that he already knows your needs before you ask. So you're not informing him of a need. What you're doing is releasing faith. You're bringing here and there together through prayer. And he sets forth five conditions here in Matthew 6, 19 to 34, familiar to all of us. What's the first one? Take no thought. If you want to bring here and there together, take no thought. And what's the second one? 
take no thought, isn't it? And the third, he said it again, take no thought. And four times he says, take no thought, and you've guessed it. I guess you have. You're way ahead of us. Five times he says, take no thought. Don't think about the here when you pray. Just release faith. Lord, I'm simply articulating this need, speaking about it so that you know I've said it and I'm believing for it and then concentrate on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Concentrate on his faithfulness. Concentrate on God. Not the need, but the answer. Get the answer in mind. You know, you've seen pictures, I'm sure, of muscle-bound men. Muscle-bound men. Have you ever heard that expression? Well, some of these sickening pictures you see where, I mean, they're nothing but a big bundle of muscles. They have lifted weights and exercised to the place that they're muscle bound. They can't run. 13 year old asthmatic child could outrun a muscle bound man. That's a fact. They can't do anything useful, not any real heavy work. They're muscle bound. All they can do is stand around, flex their muscles, and let <laughs> people take pictures of them. I mean, I don't want to digress on that either. That's really not only useless, but ridiculous. They're about the most sickening looking specimens of humanity. Even the Greek athletes never went in for it that way. They were always trim and, you know, trained right up like a well-oiled machine. You notice the runners who win races are thin and generally kind of short. You know, they're just not big men. My point is this. Like you've seen pictures of muscle-bound men who are so bound they can't do anything useful, so many Christians are like that with respect to his admonition here in Matthew 6 where he said five times, take no thought. They're thought-bound, brain-bound, because like the world, all you and anyone else has ever heard are read home, school, church, literature, is think. Now, don't do anything foolish. Use your mind. Think. Use some common sense. Think. Think. God gave you a mind. Why don't you use it? Think. Think. And they think and think. And when they get into the church and get saved and get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they keep on thinking and thinking until they think themselves out of faith. Now, I don't advocate that you avoid using the common sense that God has given every one of us. Common sense goes a long way, especially if it's sanctified or that you put a brown paper shopping bag over your head every time you have to make a decision so you won't see or think. But what I am saying, don't be so tied to thinking, so reliant on reasoning, so brain-bound, that like the muscle-bound athlete, you become thought-bound every time you have to make a decision. And you begin to reason and think to the point you worry and think yourself out of faith. And that's exactly what happens. Now, of course, when Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow, he says it five times here. He doesn't mean don't think, but don't be anxious. Don't worry. Don't sit around and think about how you're going to get the money you need or how that you're going to be able to feed and clothe and how is your family next year with taxes going up and prices and everything else. Don't worry about these things. Well, of course... Chronic doubters who will hear this message would say, I hope nobody's here that fits that category, but who would say, well, how am I going to make it? If I don't take any thought, I've got a family. How would we live? You want to be honest? Are you thinking that? I'm a businessman, and so on. How would we live the same way you live by breathing without taking any thought? <laughs> That's something you do without any thought. No one sits around and one exhale. <laughs> and times it, now it's time for two. Two exhale. You don't take any thought about it. If you had to take thought, you'd have a problem when you went to bed and went to sleep. <laughs> you'd have to stay awake to make sure that you could take thought about breathing. No one takes any thought about breathing. And the same God that gives you those two lungs and a nervous system that causes them to function automatically without you even taking thought and provides you with an abundance of air to breathe, the same God says, don't take any thought, 
don't worry about how I'm going to provide all of your other needs. I'll provide them just like I provide you with the lungs and the nervous system and the air. Amen. No one worries about there being sufficient air in this building or they wouldn't have come in or worrying about if they'll have enough air in the bedroom at night so they sit up half the night making sure that they can sleep the rest of the night or if they go in a closet will there be enough air or get on a plane with two, three hundred people in that little cubicle up there and everybody just drinking in that air and cigarettes going and all that but no one worries about will we run out of air while we're up here I'm trying to make a point. Air is so essential to life that you would die in a few seconds without it. A few minutes at the most. You'd be unconscious before you died, but just a few minutes at most. Air is so essential that we would die without it, and yet it's the one commodity that no one in this building ever takes a thought about. No one ever takes a thought about it. You just take a breath and believe that you'll have another one. You know, the air will be there. Well, if God can provide what's so essential to our life and provide it so abundantly that you never take thought about it, then why is it difficult? I'm talking to you and all the people out there that will hear the tapes. Why is it so difficult then for you to believe that he can do everything else he has said? Are you aware there's not a single promise in the Word of God that he will supply you with sufficient air. After you take this breath, you just took it, he hasn't promised you he'll give you another. And yet there are countless promises in his word that he'll provide your needs, protect you, deliver you, heal you. Why is it so difficult to believe those promises? When the one essential thing you need, you never take thought about. And you take thought about these other things. I mean, we all have along the way, and most still do, out there in Christendom. Why don't you sit up half the night to see if you can continue breathing? Or get up early to see if the sun will rise? There's no promise in the Word that it will. Or why don't you worry about whether or not all the grocery stores will run out of food before you can get to them tomorrow? There's no promise, you know, in the Word that they'll all stay open and provide you with food? Or why don't you worry about whether or not all the oceans and rivers and lakes will dry up before you can get home and get a drink? And on and on and on. Why you say, I don't have to worry about those things. In any way, it wouldn't do any good if it did. No, it wouldn't. And that's precisely the point that he makes in Matthew 6. And it's stated a little more clearly over in Luke, if you'll turn over there for a moment that you can't do anything about it anyway. So why are you worrying? Luke chapter 12, verse 22, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. For your life. You don't take thought for the air you breathe, so take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither your body what you shall put on, that is, clothing. The life is more than meat, and the body more than clothing. Consider the birds, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them. And how much more are ye better than the birds? God provides for those. They never take thought. And he said, how much more? Are you better in God's sight than the ravens or the fowls of the air? And which of you, by taking thought, could add to his stature one cubit, about 18 inches? If ye then are not able to do the thing that is least, why take you thought for the rest? If you can't do the least, and there he says, add a cubit to your stature, then why take you thought for the other things about food and clothing and raiment? Because without God providing them, you couldn't get them anyway. And people worry themselves into the grave, are out of faith, and become useless to the kingdom of God because they're trying to do that which they cannot do. Like you don't worry about the air, the streams drying up so you'll have no water, stores running out of food, your lungs stop functioning or whatever. You not only don't worry, you don't take thought. Because you say, I couldn't do anything about it anyway. And that's what he said there. He says, you can't do anything about it anyway. Why do you worry? Except God provided for you, you wouldn't get home. 
you wouldn't have a meal tomorrow. I don't care how much money you got in the bank or your pocket. In fact, the time will come as we read in the book of Revelation, your money won't do you any good anyway. But in spite of what he's trying to show us here in Luke 12 and Matthew 6, and if you've ever done much ministering or counseling, you know this happens. In spite of what you teach and what he taught and what you say about what he taught, people will come and say, but you don't know what I have to worry about, or you wouldn't be so nonchalant about it. But the thing is, I do know what you've got to worry about. Same thing I've got to worry about. Same thing the rest of us have to worry about. The difference is some of us know we don't have any choice about whether we worry or don't worry. We've learned the secret that if we're going to make it into the kingdom, we're going to have to obey him. And one of the things he stressed again and again is to exercise faith. I don't know why people think they're in the kingdom because they're in the church or make a confession of faith. The Bible says that won't save you unless obedience matches your words. You practice what you preach or what you say you believe. And so while you may feel, that is, we're talking now generally to all Christians everywhere, while some of you may feel you have a choice to pick and choose what parts of the Word of God are convenient, are not so costly to obey, and what you will ignore, while you may feel you have a choice. I don't have any. I know that I have no more choice about doubting what he said here in Matthew 6 or Luke 12 than I would have doubting what he said in John 3.16. I mean, what assurance, and you have none, what assurance do you have you're a child of God if you can't trust the one you call your heavenly Father, thou who art in heaven, can't trust him to do what he said. And yet, other than things that they just take for granted, like the sun rising in the morning and the rivers continuing to flow and supplying water, and the stores still having food. You see, we're cutting down the farm so much you can get to the place where types of food won't even be available. But everyone here just takes for granted, I can still buy a head of lettuce, I can still buy a cantaloupe, or the essentials, potatoes. They just take that for granted. And yet, Jesus said we have to trust him in all things in order to make it into the kingdom. You can't ignore the condition of faith is what we're saying. So some old chronic doubter somewhere when he hears this will be thinking, well, if that's the way it is, then I'm going to have to start giving some thought to what Jesus said. <laughs> and that's the problem. That's what's gotten you in trouble, taking thought. He says, don't take thought because you think yourself out of faith. Once you commit a need to the Lord, forget it, except to praise God that he's heard and answered your petition, Mark eleven twenty four. When you pray, believe I have provided it, healing, finances, whatever, and you shall have it. And then over in Matthew 6 and verse 34, he shows us here that we have only 24 hours in a day, and if we do what he says here in Matthew 6, then verse 34 will be true because he said to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and to take no thought for what you eat, drink, clothing, shelter, whatever. Then in verse 34 says, take no thought for tomorrow. Most people are not too worried about today if they've had a meal and a drink of water. And even if they owe bills or whatever, they're not too worried about today. But he says, take no thought for tomorrow. There's where people project their worries. For he said, tomorrow will take care for the things of itself. Sufficient is this day the evil thereof. And so if you do what he said, it'll occupy 24 hours a day of your time. What did he say? Get your attention on the there and not the here. Off your needs, whatever they may be, from healing or whatever. The key to bringing here and there together through prayer is to get your attention on the there and not the here. Well, finances are a real problem to a lot of people. I've never figured out why. Not with all the faith taught around here. 
in what God says in his word about providing your financial needs in Matthew 6, Luke 12. And yet people will still say, but what if it's a financial crisis and I'm about to lose my home or I'm a businessman and I'm about to go bankrupt? Jesus would answer, focus your attention on the there and not the house or the business here. Amen. That's what he's saying there. Amen. But what if I'm a minister and I'm in a financial crisis? And most of them seem to be from the mail I get and what I hear on the radio. <laughs> and I would have to close down some of my radio and television stations. A lot of them, or maybe all of them, I hear all the time they're saying on there, we're going to close down some. We have closed down some because no money comes from that area. What am I supposed to do? I may have to close one of the offices or close down our Bible school and on and on. What am I to do? Well, in that case, if you're a minister, it probably means that you're an exception if you go by the mail I get or hear the radio programs that I hear because apparently Matthew 6.33 is for the so-called layman <laughs> and not the quote-unquote clergyman. That if you're a clergyman, then it's all right to send out, you know, pleas and requests. I had a whole stack of this stuff that I get in the mail, but they're no longer subtle about it anymore. It starts out, I mean, the top of the page, front row can probably read it. <laughs> and this is a big evangelist, I mean, well known, and he starts out, I must take the mask off. We are in a crisis. Then he goes on to describe the crisis in four pages. He's got a lot of faith that somebody's going to read through all of that because, I mean, it's one negative thing after another. A half million dollars he needs right away just to get the building for the school they bought up to fire department and building codes, you know, so they'll let them meet there. And on and on and on. And he keeps saying, I'm going to take the mask off. I'm not going to fool you. We're in a crisis. And there's an emergency telegram. If you don't send money right now, we're going to have to close down our school. And of course, you get these. They're going to close down their broadcasts that they get on the air to beg for money on. They won't be able to beg for money any longer. <laughs> and I really like this one. I like it in the sense of it really proves my point. That there's the beggar's bag stapled to the letter. And on the back of it, it says crisis. And then where you would have quotation marks is a dollar sign on each side of the word crisis. You really need to see this to appreciate it. <laughs> and on the back, dollar crisis. And God has called them, they believe, to do nothing but that. I don't know what they do in their Bible schools, except take offerings <laughs> from the students. It is pathetic. And as you listen to the radio and you get this kind of mail, my mail is flooded with this. It's pathetic, flooded. You get the impression that they've got all of their attention focused on the here and not the there. Remember, a minister disqualifies himself if he can't trust God for his finances. He's disqualified himself before he goes out with any word because he'll have to spend all of his time begging for money. Send it in so I can beg for more money. That's what the programs, so much of them consist of. It's a long song and then, well, I don't want to be contemptible, but I just have to tell the way it is. What they call teaching, four or five minutes, and then the rest is offer 1398. A Bible, two by three feet. <laughs> it's big, folks. It's white and the words of Jesus in red letters. If you send an offering of $45, we'll send you the Bible. If you send 100 we'll put your name on a plaque in our auditorium. One, if you send $500, we will put your name on a brick and build it in the wall of the building we're building for the Lord. You know, you wonder if these men, and this is most of them, if they really know to whom Jesus addressed those words in Matthew 6 and Luke 12. First of all, to the ministers that he was sending out. You take no thought. Don't even take thought. God will provide. That's to whom he's speaking, basically and only indirectly to the rest of you, that is those of you who are 
other types of ministry in the body. But I'm talking about fivefold ministries to whom he's speaking. They're apostles. And both the Old and New Testaments again and again stress how that a minister of God, one he's called, is to trust him without reservation for everything. Material needs the least. He sends ravens to feed you if you can't get it any other way. Fed Elijah with ravens. Birds. In both the Old and New Testaments, God expects his ministers to trust him not only for the sake of proving they're worthy of his anointing and so forth, but as an example to the people. Don't you realize we ministers are examples, whether you like it or not, you are? And I found, I have to say it, I could say many, but it's probably most people are looking for an easier way out, and if they can find it in their minister or a prophet or a leader, they'll follow that instead of the word. Or oh, they're looking for somebody that begs for money and runs to the doctors, like most of them do. I'm talking about charismatic leaders and ministers. And then they use him as an example to justify why they do that. And it's a long story how that time and again people have tried to get me to side in with what they wanted to do, you know, in counseling. So they could say, well, Brother Freeman said. And sometimes we've just pulled tapes off of a tape list because... Rather than taking the principle and the intention, they are taking out of those tapes what they want. Well, you gave a definition, and you see they're following a definition which is only to make a point from the Word of God, and they start quoting you. Well, of course, you can't take everything out any more than people who misquote Jesus. You don't throw the Bible away. That isn't what I'm saying. But I'm saying people are looking for a loophole, a way out. Not everybody, but too many people. You know, Peter said some are resting the scriptures to their own destruction. And so you don't throw out the scriptures because people misuse it. That isn't what we're saying. And so first of all, if we want to bring the here, the there together through prayer, you have to focus your attention, as Jesus said, on the there. Forget the here. Just make the need known. When I needed $10,000 once, I said, Lord, I thank you. I have received it. Mark eleven twenty four. Just That's about all I said. I thank you. Mark eleven twenty four is true. I believe I have received it. Thank you for it. Did I get it? Yes. I mean, I didn't think any more about it. And that's all the thinking I did about it to release faith. That's just an example. I could give you 10 dozen, I'm sure, if we just sit down and think. And so could you, a lot of you. If you want to bring the here and there together, then get your attention off of the here, the need, the problem. Get all of your attention. Focus it on the Lord, his faithfulness, his promise, his word. There are things I'm still believing to be manifested. Whatever they are is beside the point. I take no thought for them because they were provided in Calvary. And... You know, I thank God for some trials. That's what the Bible says to do. I thank him that he counts me faithful to endure, say, a physical trial. And we don't want to sound like we're looking for sympathy, but there's some areas that a faith minister has to walk out to know that it works so that when he preaches it to you, he doesn't say, well, there it is in the Word. Well, that's enough. That isn't the point. But God has ordained that we who live by the gospel, that we have to walk by the gospel. That's turning another promise around, you know, but to make a point. So secondly, you want to bring heaven and earth together, then when you pray, keep a positive attitude. Keep a positive attitude. Now that's not unimportant, it's not trite. It isn't new, but it's essential that we hear these things in new ways so that we do this. It's a temptation if you're hurting, say it's a physical thing, to look at the negative side of it. Look at the symptoms or look at the condition. Or if it's three days until they foreclose, to look at the negative conditions. Or if it's three days past when they should have foreclosed. That's happened too. 
like one brother told me, you know, it was 30 days past the deadline. And they just kept holding on. Holding on. That's another story I think I've told you. And then he said the lawyers opened their mouth to say we foreclose. It was a quarter million dollars worth of property they were foreclosing on. And out came out, we'll give you three more days. <laughs> and at the end of three days, 33 days over the deadline, God manifested it. They had to keep a positive attitude is what I'm saying. Keeping a positive attitude basically means when you pray, you're praying with expectation. Now that'll keep your attitude positive. If you're not sure, if you're thinking, well, I'm going to have to wait 30 days, six months, three years, because sometimes that happens. And then... Old Abraham's experience comes floating up in your consciousness 25 years. You finally get that one down and then comes floating up Noah 120 years. After his call to prepare the ark, 120 years. Well, that can get depressing if you think <laughs> 25 years. Caleb waited, what was it, 40 years? Oh my. Don't think about that. Just think like the Bible says, I have received. And every day, just believe that tooth is filled. Amen. Hallelujah. Or restored. Amen. However he wants to do it, doesn't matter. Amen. And when your tongue goes exploring about your mouth, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, we never told anyone here, not one time, that you can't go to a dentist. I'm just saying there's some of us that have taken Jesus, not only as our physician, but our dentist. Amen. Our assurance, we don't need insurance. I mean, completely. Protector, deliverer. Thank God we wouldn't be here tonight if he wasn't a deliverer. And we trusted in him to deliver us. The blood of Jesus can save you from some serious accidents and broken bones and whatever. Your faith in that and speaking it in time of need. So to pray with a positive attitude means you're praying with expectation. You'll never get your attitude in the positive direction or dimension unless you're expecting something to happen. But a lot of people defeat themselves in their prayers really before they get to expressing their need in their introduction. Generally, most people when they pray, they won't say, I've got a need, Lord. They will say something first. And they come for prayer, and that's fine. There's a place for that. But sometimes they defeat themselves in their introduction to you or to God. And there's no faith there. Like here's a letter I received. I get letters like this, and they are in the minority. I'm just trying to educate you about don't defeat yourself before you start. Here's a letter. See what you would do with it. And they have a need they want you to pray about later. They'll get to that. I know, this person says, I know there are letters that you receive which you feel are not worthy of your time to read. And this just may be one of them. <laughs> now, if you get a lot of mail, you see, some of you, if you only got a letter once a month, you'd go on and read it. But that introduction really inspires a busy person to go on and read the rest of it. I know you get a lot of mail that's not worthy of taking your time to read it, and this is probably one of them. Now, why should you read any further? I don't. If you want that kind of mail, no, it's personal. Or I say, I would give it to you, and you can handle it any way you want. But there's no faith in that letter. Because when they ask for prayer or want you to agree with them, they've already told me that they're not believing that I'm going to even read the rest of the letter to see what they want me to pray about. How can there be any faith in that? When you pray, be bold like the Syrophoenician woman. I mean, pray with some spiritual backbone. Or if you want somebody to pray for you, come up here and do like some do that really quicken my faith. They start confessing what they believe from the Word of God and what's going to happen before they ever ask you to pray. When you lay your hand on my head, I'm healed of this arthritic condition. Now that inspires your faith. 
telling me, well, I know a lot of people come up here with this condition and you're probably just tired hearing it. And you'd be surprised how many say when they come up here for prayer, and I know you're tired. No, I'm not tired. They tell me I'm tired. You know, it's 1030. <laughs> I know you're tired, but if you'll just take the time to listen to all, and then they start through it. Well, that would make you tired. <laughs> Brother Freeman, I heard you when you were in Louisville. We've been trying for two years to sell this house. We can't sell it. Now, would you think there's a lot of faith in that call? But here's the way they call. Brother Freeman, we heard you speak on faith in Louisville, and we want you to agree with us for the sale of the house. Now, we've been trying for two years, so we believe when you agree, it'll sell. It's sold, I think, in three days. They've been trying two years. Three days. Another cause. I've got my building on the market one-third, 33% higher than the market value. But I've claimed that much for this building, and the realtor won't even list it. He said, it's crazy. You can't get that kind of money out of it. He said, when we agree, it's sold. He sold it right away. I think insurance men or somebody came around, that's just what they were looking for. Yeah, it was way above the market, but the insurance men have all the money, so it was no problem. <laughs> you better believe they've got all the money. Not mine, but they've got all of most people's money. People even have these huge sums to die on. Well, anyway. In another meeting up in Michigan, Brother, I heard you preach a message on faith this morning, tonight. You're going to preach on faith again? Yes, and after the message I'm coming, and as soon as you lay your hand on my head, I'm healed of cancer. Now that's faith talking. That quickens your faith. He didn't go through all how bad it was, the doctor's reports, and how long he's been this and that and the other. He didn't even want prayer in the morning. He was getting himself ready for the prayer in the evening by his confession of faith. Or in Georgia, a woman says, agree with me for the creation of an eardrum. I don't have an eardrum in this ear, whichever one it was. When we agree together, God will create an eardrum, and I will be able to hear out of this ear. The next afternoon, she comes by. Just pointed, you know, no big publishing it, you know, on the rooftops or anything, but just said, new eardrum. I hear perfectly out of it now, overnight. New eardrum. That quickens your faith. That quickens your faith when you hear people say that. But there's no way to develop a positive attitude when you pray or when you hear the Word of God if you condition everything with the negative. I found time and again... And again, it's in the minority, but it happens enough that you have to mention it so you don't fall into this. After a strong message of faith, it's happened time and again. There may be one or two in a prayer line that reaches halfway around the aisles. After a strong message of faith, someone will come, and instead of saying what they believe and what the need is and believing God on the basis of the word you just preached, that he's going to heal it, they will hold up that prayer line. While they give you a complete medical history, go through all of the aspects and details of the problem, how bad it is, how long they've been seeking healing, who prayed for them, the doctor's diagnosis. And generally, by the time they get to you, everybody's given them up. And they need a resurrection rather than a healing. I mean, from the way they talk. And they look upon the altar as a psychiatrist's couch and the minister as a psychiatrist. You see, faith comes by hearing the word, Romans 10, 17. So when you come for prayer, if it's tonight or whenever, when you come for prayer after you've heard the word, bring some of that faith with you, not your medical history. All that does is diminish my faith. And yet, even when you say that, you've got some old chronic doubter well, how would you know how to pray for me unless I told you how bad it was? Unless I told you what the doctor's report was? How would you know how to pray unless I give you the details? See, they confuse you with a psychiatrist or a doctor who wants to know all that. How would you know how to pray if I don't tell you all this? That's the easiest thing in the world to answer. I would pray in faith if you don't tell me all that. See, I would put into operation some of that faith 
that you just heard about in the message we just preached and just taught, which you were supposed to bring with you. So if you don't tell me anything and just say, I'm believing God and believing this promise, then praise the Lord, I'll pray in faith. There's some people I can't pray for, and it's because they don't have that expectation. They don't have that positive attitude. Bring a positive attitude. God encourages you to do this. One man said, if you can do anything, help us when the disciples couldn't cast the demon out. He said, in effect, if I can do anything, he said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. He just throws the responsibility back on us, you see. He isn't being unkind any more than I am when I say, if you don't bring some faith, it won't work. And that I generally don't read beyond the first sentence or paragraph, really, if they start out in the negative. That is, if they're asking for you to agree with them, way out on the West Coast, someone sent a request for a husband, for a prayer cloth. I had the church here agree together and pray, agree with this sister for the healing of her husband. And that prayer cloth had no sooner gotten to her, and we told her how to use it, you know, because God has healed this way more than once. That's Acts 19. She had no sooner gotten that, and I told her the church had prayed over it, the prayer of faith, and we were believing with her until I got a letter back saying, would you just keep on praying for us because he's really bad off? You know, as if we had not done a thing, or as if she had not even requested a prayer cloth. My friend, whatever you ask for, you expect to receive it. And if you ask for someone else to pray for you, then it's going to be an application of Matthew 18, 19, which you've already quoted. That is that we must be agreeing. Now notice it again. He said, where two of you are agreed on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. We've got to be agreeing. Now, while there is a technical application of that, yet every prayer that someone prays with you about is an application of that principle. We have to be in agreement. I can't be thinking, you know, about the there, what God will do if we'll believe him, and you be thinking about the here, how bad your problem is. I can't be thinking, as the word says, nothing is impossible with God, and you be wondering while I'm praying if it's really possible in your case. Some people you pray for, they don't even close their eyes. I know there's a view that pray with your eyes open. You can pray with them open or closed. I have a feeling that it's more reverent to have your eyes closed as you pray, but we won't get into that. Some people never close their eyes. They're just staring at your hand. Just sometimes while you're praying, your eyes come open. And they're just standing there with a blank stare. <laughs> like, if he'll hurry and get done, we'll see if it happens. And if it doesn't, I've got to talk to you. And they want counseling. Now, there's a place for counseling. How many times have we said it? But it's never after you've just preached a message on faith. Because you just counseled them from the pulpit. And anything you tell them is what you just counseled over the pulpit about. And that was anointed. I'm not suggesting it isn't when you counsel, but not always. It's not the same. Oh, it's not the same. I love all of you who are in the ministry and enjoy talking to you after. But when I listen to you on tape, I still know your name. But you see, it has a different effect on me. It's under the anointing. And I'm not hearing the person. It could be John Doe. It doesn't matter. I'm hearing God speak. That is, if he isn't speaking, then we don't want him up here, do we? <laughs> if he isn't speaking through them. There's a place for counseling. We've said it. But not right after a message. I don't know how many times people have said to me, I came with a problem tonight. I came with a question. We brought this sister. She has a lot of problems that we just had to get answers to. And do you know you answered every question in the message? I don't know how many times that has been said. Praise God for that. They expected God to speak or could speak through his word as well as through a man after he got done preaching the word and the anointing had lifted. They believed God could speak while he was under the anointing through the word to them. And 
I have to say it again, most people probably never come if they have a need expecting for God to speak to them through the Word and answer the need, answer the problem. They'd rather hear what man has to say. And certainly God uses men in counseling at times. Hear what we're saying. But where did you ever see Jesus after he taught and preached, saying, now if you've got any further questions and problems, if I haven't settled it all, our hours are 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, no Saturday counseling. Bring your pallet. We'll use it for psychiatrist's couch. <laughs> and you can tell me all of your problems in detail because you'll have time there to do that. We'll set you up an appointment. We have an office and staff. And I'll see what I can dredge up, and then we'll pray for the healing of your memories. <laughs> Which I guess you know in this church is an error to begin with. We're not Christian psychiatrists to try to dredge up your problems and pray for the healing of your memories. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. So if you need deliverance, that's another question, but we're not going to dredge up and I don't even want to hear. I've heard enough in the occult realm to write a book. I have, Angels of Light. <laughs> People say, well, you've probably never heard of this one. I say, no, I've heard of all of them. It's just a different form. I've heard of things, friends, that you have to know that those things happen out there in the spiritual dimension that they could even happen. Like vampires, are there such things? Well, what if you've seen the scars where a vampire bit a person in the full of the moon because he'd placed himself under occult powers and saw the female vampire and she bit him and he has the scars and they turn brilliant red at the full of the moon and terribly oppressed and bound. You don't have to understand it particularly to know that these things happen. So what we're saying is we don't want to dredge up all of that past. You can tell us enough to know how to pray for you. You know, if it's occult or healing or whatever. Believe me, friends, I stop people up here. I stop people on the phone. And I get letters 10 pages, 15 pages, 20 pages long where they give those details. Sometimes my wife said, let me read it to you. I'll help simplify things. And I'll say, just summarize it because I've heard it all before. What are they believing for? What do they need? We'll deal with that. No, I don't want to know it. I've been through it too many times, friends. There's nothing new under the sun. Solomon said it. Ecclesiastes. There really isn't, just different forms of it. Tell me something new. Well, anyway, <laughs> in spite of all you say, some people still would say, I'd rather have a man to tell me in my ear personally even though I just heard it over the pulpit under the anointing, I want to hear it again because that's what you'll hear. Praise God for people who don't need that, who when they hear the word say, you answered the thing. Amen. The problem's solved. I came for counseling. I don't need counseling. I just want to tell you I don't need it. That's what I'm here for. Or they write you or call you. I don't know about you, but I don't have any more confidence in a pastor's shoulder than I do a psychiatrist's couch if they're substitutes for faith in the Word of God. Amen. They're often substitutes. So if you want to move heaven and earth together, bring them together through prayer, then keep a positive attitude when you pray. Keep a positive attitude when you hear the Word of God. Don't say as some people do and they get up here after that strong word and they'll say, well, that may work for most people, but if you just knew what I had to worry about, if you just knew what my problem was, which can only mean they didn't listen to the Word. They didn't mix faith with the Word when they heard it. Now that is serious. Remember in Hebrews 4 and verse 2 where God says He rejected Israel because, why? They did not mix faith with the Word they heard. That's serious. You've got to mix faith in what you're hearing tonight. God can heal you, baptize you in the Spirit, save you, whatever. Mix faith in what I just said. Or he says he's going to judge, and he will reject. I don't know why the church thinks that they have some corner on God's grace. He'll reject a person that's a church member just as quickly, or a whole church, as he did Israel. 
if we don't believe him. That's why we started out by saying, you bring heaven and earth together when you have a need by your faith. It has to be believing prayer. Now you've heard the word tonight. Did any faith arise in your heart? Well, it should have. Even if you are full of faith, there's always room for a little more. And you don't have to wait two years to get a mountain of faith to move what you think is your mountain. He said a mustard seed of faith will move any mountain in your life. Some of the strongest faith we've seen is out of people as we travel the country who would hear only one message on faith or one statement in that message. Like the surgeon down south years ago. I just mentioned I don't have insurance. I have assurance, Psalm 91. And the next day we went out to lunch together. And he said, well, my insurance agents, plural, are really upset with me. I said, why? He said, I've canceled all of my insurance, including the malpractice. <laughs> I said, I didn't preach on insurance. I only mentioned I don't have any. I said, I've never seen anybody come to that position as quickly as you. Most people have to pray about it and seek the Lord to give up their blue cross and receive the old rugged cross and give up their blue shield so they can have faith as a shield. Oh, it takes them a while. Oh, it takes them a while. I said, I've never seen anyone come so quickly to that position. I just mentioned I don't have insurance because I don't need it to have assurance. You know, I said, people have to pray about it a long time. Well, he said, you don't have to pray about what's in the Word. See, he had not heard that before. The very next day. Oh, and he was just rejoicing. What if he ever got sued for malpractice? He did. Nothing the Bible says you won't get sued. I'm believing I won't, you know. I'm not claiming that. I'm saying there's no promise that you won't have trials. But he just sat back, you know, and hired no attorney and committed it to the Lord and smiled through it all. And the judge dismissed the case. He didn't have to say a word except give his name and address. So it doesn't take forever for you to get faith. Why should you have to say, well, I'm going to have to think about all this tonight? That's your problem. You think yourself out of faith. Praise God, when I heard the faith message in 1966, I mean, my mind just grabbed on that like a bear trap. By the third day, the Lord said, that's your ministry too. And then I realized I'd been walking by faith with what little light I had since 1952 anyway. So he'd been preparing me all along. But it doesn't take forever. When you hear the word, faith is supposed to come. Faith comes by hearing the word. Have you heard something here tonight that isn't the word? I mean, we've been reading the word, quoting the word, telling you how people deal with us and we deal with them. I mean, it doesn't take forever to get faith if you hear the word. But you've got to keep this positive attitude when you pray or when you hear the word or when you read something like our literature, for example, or listen to our tapes, because if you don't, well, we can't help you. And I know God can't help you. And he doesn't want me helping you increase your doubts by saying, oh, yes, I'll pray for you or agree with you. And then you get nothing. That only increases your doubts because you get nothing when it's not faith. James 1, let not that man, if he doubts, think he'll receive anything from the Lord. That's Holy Scripture. Keep a positive attitude. Expect an answer. Like the letter I got. Another one of those <laughs> missiles. I just read your book, it began, on how to know God's will. I've read it cover to cover. I have two questions. First, how can I know God's will about such and such a problem? <laughs> Somehow... I never could get to the second question. <laughs> Said, I have two. <laughs> I stopped with the first. I don't know what the second question was. I don't care. I can't pray for a person like that. Read it cover to cover. Now, how do I know God's will? Well, 70 or 80 pages to show you how. Sometimes we'll wave that to a person. They have an important decision to make. They want to know if the Lord wants them off there or here or whatever. I tell them it's all right here. We get that question so much. This is why we wrote the book. And it's all here. And here's a whole section on how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, how to discern it. 
Sometimes they take it, but sometimes you can tell it's just a letdown. It's only about 75 pages. And I can see now, if they turn that down, why they turn down the Deeper Life book, which is over twice as long. If you want to bring here and there together through prayer, you must distinguish between what God has said and what man is saying. What God says, what man says about what God said. Now that's very important because most people are following what men have taught them. Or if they weren't aware that they consciously absorbed it, some of it they did. School, their reading, home, church. So if we want to bring heaven and earth together, that need met, whatever, we have to distinguish between what God said and what man has said, man's word and God's word. I read an article not too long ago entitled, Faith Dares to Fail. Faith dares to fail. Faith dares not fail. Or else it's not faith, it's failure. And the man is pretty good on most of his writings, but that's terrible. He didn't have the faith message. He had the deeper life message. Faith dares to fail. That's the world's philosophy. It's better to have tried and failed than never to have tried at all. You heard that in school. You probably heard it in church. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Why is it better to have tried and failed than not to have tried at all? Go ahead and give me an answer for that one. All you've done is expended money and energy and time and you still ended up a failure. It's not better to have tried and failed. It's better to have believed and succeeded. <laughs> That's the world's philosophy to say that faith dares to fail. Such an idea, you see, ministers doubt. You cannot pray as we've been talking for a few minutes with expectation if you think you're going to fail. On the contrary, we have to distinguish between man's word, God's word. And he was a good, solid Christian writer on deeper life. But it's man's word at that point. And God's word, what is it? Well, guess where we're going to take you to? Mark 11, 24 again. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you've not failed, that you receive, and you shall have them. Now you can't believe that faith dares to fail and pray with expectation. And you have to learn how to distinguish, as I say, between man's word and God's word. And you have to be so discerning in this last hour that you can discern, even when he's quoting the word of God, if he's giving you God's intended meaning of that word. Amen. Just because he's quoting scripture does not mean that he has God's intent when he inspired that word to be written down. People quote the word all the time. You ever turn your radio on? I don't care if you do or not. I can hear enough out of line with the word of God over one or two religious programs to sound like I listen to it all the time. I don't, but I caught this one not too long ago. Listen to this one. Radio ministers, send in $1,000 and you can sponsor a leper church. James 2 says, faith without works is dead. And as soon as he said it, my heart said, and works without faith is dead too. Because he's quoting James 2, faith without works is dead. That was not God's intent for him to use it that way because it contradicts the fifth chapter and the first chapter. That when you pray, believe you have it, don't doubt, or God will not give you anything. And then the fifth chapter, he's talking about sick people. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. Where in the New Testament do you ever read of a leper's church or a coronary patient's church or a tubercular church or an alcoholic's church? It's a contradiction in terms. God sent and sends his ministers forth with the healing message as a part of the gospel. And whenever churches in the New Testament were established, they had written over them the church of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine a leper's church? 
Lepers have been healed time and again through the prayer of faith. Some have had things restored that were missing. And the time will come, dear friends, with this end time faith message when you'll see that. It'll be so common. You won't yawn when you see it. No one yawns at a miracle. But it'll be so common that you won't think it unusual. Send in a thousand dollars. A minister of the gospel. At least he says he is. And you can sponsor a leper's church. James 2 says, faith without works is dead. James 5 said, works without faith is dead. He that prays the prayer of faith, the sick will be healed and the Lord will raise him up. The very book he quotes teaches, call for the elders of the church. You see, the church today builds hospitals. God's word says go heal. Man's word says build a hospital. God's word says go work a miracle. Man's word says send out a medical missionary. And that'll be sanctifying, you know, the work because he's a missionary practicing medicine. We've got charismatics that take up money and take medical supplies and so forth over to Haiti and other places. I've ministered with some of them. I don't do it anymore. There was a time when God wanted to get an exposure of this end time faith message. And after he'd done that, he just said, you don't minister with those anymore who contradict my word. Now, that doesn't mean they're not saved. We're not raising those questions. We didn't say we're better than them. We just believe more than them. I don't know why he and they think they have a choice about it anyway. I don't feel like I've got a choice. If I'm going to preach, I have to preach healing, a full gospel. I can't say, let's take up funds because there are people over here who are sick. Well, go preach the gospel to them, and those who believe can get healed. Amen. Amen. You know, the church in the New Testament is a school, but many times I've wondered what school most Christians are going to. And from what I hear them say and see them do, it could only mean they're going to the school of doubt. The only punctuation they know is the question mark. <laughs> Their alphabet consists of two letters, the I and the F. Yes, that spells if. <laughs> and in their English classes, they learn these popular phrases in Christianity today, like, yes, I know that's what the Bible says, but. <laughs> Why, yes, I know Jesus said that, but. And then they point to some other dispensation. Oh, yes, I know that God can heal, but, but, but. The school of doubt. Where do you go to school? Your confession will tell us. Here's another religious writing. I read you the one that I got on the radio. Here's another one. Writing on prayer. Showing, by the way, the contrast between man's word and God's word again. This author says, Prayer is to be offered with submissiveness. That sounds pious. But remember, a promise of God is a revelation of His will. And when you believe it, you're submitting. But anyway, to offer prayer with submissiveness and with Conditional faith. Conditional faith? Contradiction in terms. If faith is conditional, you've got if on it, and then that's doubt. Faith is never conditional or it isn't faith. Now, there are conditions to get an answer to prayer, and one of them is faith. Not conditional faith. Well, he goes on. So pray with conditional faith, trusting God to answer if, <laughs> that's conditional faith, if it's in the best interests of all concerned. Otherwise, desire that he doesn't answer you or that he substitutes what he knows best. That's the popular view in the church you left. Still the popular view. I challenge you to reconcile what I just read from any part of the Word of God, Genesis to Revelation, you couldn't in 10,000 years. You couldn't take a bulldozer and get that theology in between the lines. <laughs> the Word of God says, when you pray, believe you have received and you shall have it. Amen. How could you not have it if you believe it, and how could you believe it if you didn't have it? Now, the manifestation, we know moment, a month, whatever, but believe I have heard and answered your petition. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Ask anything according to my will, there's a revelation of it. Hundreds and hundreds of promises. 
then I hear your prayer. You have, past tense, your petition. We know those by heart. Luke 11, 9 to 13. Whatever you ask the Father for, he'll give you the precise thing. That is an answer to prayer, Jesus said. If you ask for bread, you don't get a stone, you get bread. And then he gives you three examples of what you can pray for, and the Father will give you meat or bread or whatever you need, is his point. The specific thing asked for. We're talking about distinguishing man's word from God's word if you want to bring heaven and earth together when you pray. How could you pray in faith and believe you have received if you pray for healing and you get the grace to bear it like the church teaches today? That's no answer. An answer to prayer is the precise thing, Luke 11, 9 to 13. If you ask for healing, you don't get non-healing or the grace to bear it. He said if you ask for bread, you don't get a stone. Jesus said that. Son of God said that. What good does it do to pray for $30,000 and he substitutes a free ride down to the poor farm? You got no money to even hire a taxi to go to the poor house. That's what they teach. He knows best. What good does it do to pray for God to open a blind man's eyes if he sends him a dozen pencils and a tin cup so that he can beg for his breakfast out in front of your church? What good does it do for you to pray about a need and someone says, did you get an answer? Oh, yes, I did. God said, no. <laughs> no is not an answer. Yes is an answer to whatever promise he made you. And remember, 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God are already answered yes in the affirmative. Meet the conditions and you move right into the receiving of the answer. A no is not an answer. A substitute surely isn't an answer. If your car breaks down, I mean, it's not a question of repair. It's just beyond repair. You use some of that faith and said, Lord, I'm believing, I'm trusting. And he sends you a pair of roller skates. <laughs> That's what they're teaching. He can substitute what he knows best. Well, maybe you need the exercise, but <laughs> 20 miles to work, you'll never get there on time. Is there any wonder that no one has any faith today in offering prayers of petition because they don't know anyone's getting any answers? I mean, in the religious system as a whole. What good does it do to pray for something if you don't get the answer, if you meet the conditions? You know, just like in Luke 11 where he says, God will give you the precise thing you pray for. If you ask for bread, you get bread, not a stone. If you ask for an egg, you don't get a scorpion a fish, you won't get a serpent. Now, if you wouldn't do that to your children, he says, then how much more will the Heavenly Father give the good things to those that ask him for the good things? You don't pray for serpents and scorpions and stones. He'll give you what you ask for. He said that. Amen. Then in Matthew 6, our text, he gives you seven definite petitions to pray for. After our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. If you don't believe it's coming, why do you pray that? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you don't believe that'll happen, it'll happen in the millennium. Why would you pray it? Then he says, ask for your bread day to day. Ask for your daily bread. Ask for forgiveness. I'm just taking a few of them. Ask for forgiveness because you have forgiven those who've sinned against you. Bring us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Now what if you prayed for that? Give us today our daily bread and he began to clutter down stones. That's not foolish because that's the way we're taught to pray in institutional religion. He knows best. He gives definite things to pray for, expect and receive. What if you said, forgive me my sins and he judged you for them? I've forgiven those who've sinned against me. Forgive me. He said, pray that way. What if he judged you? Just cut you off from the land of the living. And bring us not into temptation. And he brought you into temptation. You couldn't overcome it. And then he judged you because you fell into temptation. Lead us not into evil. And he delivered you over into the snare of the devil. Well, these things are impossible to think about as you pray. And yet, that's precisely the mentality that the church of our day has when it prays. 
Psalm 50 and 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. Well, what if you trusted him in the day of trouble to deliver you? You desperately needed it, and he shouted down out of heaven and said, Well, you got yourself in that mess. Now get out the best way you can. Oh, <laughs> that hurts to think about it. That we can trust God to do what he says and give us what we need and what we believe for. Oh, thank God I've been delivered from that old dead institutional type prayer to pray a conditional prayer of faith about the promises of God, a conditional faith prayer. And know that if it's not in the best interest of all concerned that you don't want him to answer you and you want him to substitute. Now that sounds pious, it just is in Scripture. He never taught us to pray that way. He said, what you pray for you'll get and when you pray you believe you get that and you will. And the Father will give you the precise thing you pray for. Now, if it's not in line with his word, then you can't pray the prayer of faith. But that's old hat here. We know that. Is there any wonder that prayer has so declined over the centuries and that Christians in all the churches are turning to man for help who can't help them? Sometimes they can temporarily relieve the problem or the suffering. But there's no permanent help. Is there any wonder that Christians everywhere are turning to man for help. It's because they've been taught in the school of doubt to pray if it be thy will about what is clearly revealed as his will. Hundreds of promises that are so clear a child could understand them. It's because they've been taught to pray if it be thy will. They've been deluded. They've not received answers to that kind of prayer. So they've lost their faith in prayer. And they can't bring heaven and earth together because they're not praying a prayer that God will hear. So, Father, it's our prayer that this word will not return to thee void, but will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. We'll fulfill that which you please. And how we do know that you're pleased for men and women to believe your word, to mix faith in what they hear when they hear it. And we're just going to believe that there are people that have been mixing and mixing tonight faith with what they've heard. It's our prayer that they will continue to do that and be prepared for the soon manifestation of the sons of God. In Jesus' name.